The meat on your body comes and goes every year. Your skeleton is not the same one you had five years ago, but neural DNA is an exception. It is there for all time. You come into the world with it. It records. It's like a storage place for memory, not only our personal memory, but any entity or organism which has DNA in it. There is a way to find a connection to it. This is it. You put a radio into the DNA and this ESR resonation will begin to flood your system because the bond will be permanent. There will be no way to disrupt it. It will tell you everything, everything that can be known in the world of space and time because it contains your own and everyone else's records. We are all connected through this magical substance, which is what makes life possible and which causes it to take on its myriad forms. All DNA is the same. It is the settings that are different. You get butterflies, mastodons, or human beings, depending on the settings. Or so you say, was my non-committal reply. For the moment, I simply did not know what to say. He stared at me, clearly expecting more. I believed in the infinite self-transforming power of the human mind and species, and I could suppose that there are parallel worlds and alternative dimensions. I could imagine any number of science fiction possibilities, provided I was not asked to believe that I was about to be personally present at their discovery or unleashing. But this is what he was saying that we had somehow stumbled upon or been led to the trigger experience in the human world that would transform the ontological basis of reality so that the mind and matter would become the same thing and reflect the human will perfectly. How could anyone conceive of such a thing? We had come to La Chirera with a belief that if life and mind are possible, then the mysteries of the universe might well be inexhaustible. Something very passive yet ever-present was there, elaborating these ideas in our minds, something that we had thought of for some days as the mushroom. We talked several hours about these ideas, and what finally emerged was the idea that we needed a test, or at least Dennis maintained that a partial test of this idea could be undertaken to convince me. He thought that as the superconducting state became voice stabilized, there should be a marked lowering of temperature in the immediate area. In our talking, we had left the area of the hut and drifted down the forest path. It would be possible to attempt to generate the effect of coolness right there on the spot, he supposed. We seated ourselves on the sandy path facing each other with the afternoon sun on both of us. After a couple of preliminary low mechanical buzzes, Dennis made a sound very similar to the sound that he had unleashed in the Knoll house three days before. This sound had an extremely peculiar quality, and as it rose in intensity, I looked down at the hairs on my arms and saw them rise as goose flesh formed and a wave of intense shivering swept over me. I yelled to him to stop. He stopped instantly and seemed much drained by the effort. I was quite disoriented. I frankly could not tell whether a real wave of very cold air had swept over me or whether the particular sound had somehow made my body react as though it were being exposed to cold air. It was not lost on me that if the effect had truly generated a blast of cold air, then it had violated the known laws of physics. No, that was not lost on me. But I did not care to experiment further. The whole thing had an eerie aura about it, and if the effect was real, who knew what could come of pushing it too far? I was more confused than ever by my enigmatic brother and his burgeoning ideas and abilities. The whole thing seemed absurd and yet very compelling, 
like a hypnotic game into which one becomes absorbed in spite of oneself. We returned to our camp and mentioned to all present that Dennis had generated the wave of cold air that he had predicted from the theory, but it was all sufficiently ambiguous that no one felt drawn to comment. It was already quite clear that two camps were emerging, one that wished no further part in these matters, whatever their validity, and one reflecting our own opinion that cautious experiment was indicated. A commonality of language was breaking down. After dinner, Vanessa and Dave returned to the Riverside house, and the three of us settled into our first night in the forest since arriving at La Cherera. Dennis was in a state of continual activity, amplifying his ideas and trying out new wrinkles on us. He retired into a world of very intense activity. He wrote his ideas over and over the steps to do it and the theory of why it should work. He was spending lots of time alone writing, or he would come back and talk to us. He was on to something very strange. His word pictures caused reality to shimmer and wrinkle at the edges. He was really in touch with this bubbling obsidian fourth dimensional fluid that we were going to bond into a usable tool and end history and go to the stars. 